years after the eruption, likely killing off plant life across the globe. Hardest hit would have been tropical areas like Africa. Africa is where we were at the time, and uh, so it would affect us directly. And secondly, uh, it's the tropical vegetation that never experiences cold temperatures, so has no adaptations for cold temperatures whatsoever. The frigid temperatures killed off much of the African plant life, and the resulting famine may have decimated much of the human race. It may be that the 6.5 billion people who inhabit the Earth today are the direct descendants of the few who survived the Toba eruption. If a single eruption like Toba is powerful enough to almost destroy the human race, what would a similar supervolcano do today? When a large giant eruption were to occur, I think there's little that man can do about it. The biggest thing we have to do first is understand them. That's why scientists are studying every aspect of the Yellowstone volcano. What they discover may be the key to our survival. For most of us, Yellowstone National Park is one of our greatest natural treasures. But what lies just below the surface could destroy it all. The sense of scale of the catastrophic eruptions for Yellowstone is, is very hard to grasp. 640,000 years ago, a supervolcano in Yellowstone devastated the region. Today, scientists monitor the ground movement in Yellowstone to determine if and when another super eruption might occur. We don't know exactly what happens before a super eruption takes place and how much time one has before the eruption actually goes off. The rise and fall of the ground, for example, could indicate the movement of magma below, a possible danger sign. These movements cover very short distances over long periods of time. So scientists have placed throughout the park 12 global positioning satellite monitoring stations that can detect ground movements within a quarter of an inch. Geologists have also gained a bird's eye view of the situation. We use satellites in this case to take uh, pictures of the ground as it's moving over time. And so we can compare two different passes of the satellite that are perhaps a year apart and make a map of how much different spots on the ground have moved. With these tools, geologists have been able to document changes in the caldera. It's constant rising and falling over time. According to recent satellite data, much of the caldera is being lifted up. What we've seen has been uplifting uh, now at rates of six to eight centimeters per year. Those are very high rates. The most dramatic uplift is just north of Yellowstone Lake, in the area geologists call a resurgent dome. And we have within this caldera these orange areas here. These are resurgent domes. These are areas that are uplifted while the caldera was collapsing and subsiding. Geologists believe that these two areas were lifted up by the magma chamber as the caldera was formed. It's thought that some magma is still inside these domes, holding up these areas. But they couldn't be sure until now. We've seen this model of the Yellowstone magma plume, the tube through which molten rock from the Earth's core reaches the magma chamber sitting on top of the plume. Using similar data, geologists have created this 3D illustration of the magma chamber as it sits below the Yellowstone caldera. This is a three-dimensional image like a CAT scan or an X-ray of the Earth. It is, it's giving us uh, an image of what we think is the magma system that drives Yellowstone. This U-shaped chamber is thought to contain more than 300 cubic miles of partially molten rock, a hundred times larger than Pinatubo's magma chamber and is just five miles below the surface. More importantly, the area of the most dramatic uplift spotted by the satellites is directly above a peak of the chamber. This suggests the magma chamber is expanding, pushing up against the Earth's surface at this peak. The other area of striking ground deformation is near the Norris Geyser Basin, the hottest and most unstable thermal basin in the park. 
Norris Geyser Basin is one of the most dynamic of the hydrothermal areas at Yellowstone. Um, it's always changing. We're always noticing new things that are happening. Just a few years ago, satellite images showed Yellowstone's greatest rise in this area. Recently, however, it's reversed its direction and is now subsiding. It's not actually within the Yellowstone caldera, yet it's one of the, the highest temperature thermal areas in the park. And it is possible that there is some magma extending uh, to the north beneath that region. The source of the basin's volatility could be magma, or another key component to volcanic activity, earthquakes. The earthquakes are essentially the heartbeat of the system. They are an integral part of the active, uh, if you wish, uh, mountain building and volcanism of Yellowstone. Like smoke and fire, volcanoes and earthquakes go hand in hand. The pressure from the magma, which can explode into a volcano, also forces the ground to shift, causing earthquakes. They can be the telltale signs of an impending eruption. The two main precursors to a volcanic eruption, seismicity and ground deformation, are very carefully monitored in Yellowstone. In this computer model, each red dot represents an earthquake. Typically, hundreds of earthquakes are detected across the park each year. In recent years, the greatest earthquake activity has been centered under two areas of the park. Well, you can see we have earthquakes that are concentrated on the north side of Yellowstone coming down through the park and then out extending on the east side of the Teton Fault right here. What concerns geologists is when a center of earthquake activity overlaps an area of shifting terrain. At the Norris Geyser Basin, that seems to be what's happening. There are dozens of fault lines at this spot. That's very critical because if magma is starting to move up, we would expect to see a bulging in an area and associated earthquakes as the ground starts to crack. The fear is faults that make up the earthquake zone could crack under pressure from the magma below, releasing an eruption. Geologists are also watching the park's geysers, hot springs, and mud pots, looking for drastic changes in temperatures and chemical content anything that might indicate a major movement of magma. At the moment, geologists do not believe an eruption is imminent. But if the water temperatures were to rise, the ground begin to swell, or there were an increase in earthquake activity, another Yellowstone eruption could be building. I think that we are smart enough as uh, geoscientists now that we would probably have weeks to perhaps months of uh, indicators before anything like that would occur. However, predicting the precise timing of an eruption is far from simple. Scientists have been fooled in the past. We've seen it in Yellowstone. There's bulging, there's vibrations, there's increased seismicity. There's all the things one would expect and go, oh, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And then, nothing. Therein lies the problem. All we can do is monitor the volcano, but it may not be enough to predict a possible eruption. Mount St. Helens was the most scrutinized volcano in history, and it exploded before the area could be cleared, killing 56 people. At Yellow